Well, here we are, gathered together. That's what we do as human beings. We gather and socialize and interact. Not only here today in this venue, but in towns. That's what we do. We group together. If I take a look at a satellite picture of the Earth at night, something like America, I notice on the East Coast there's New York and Philadelphia lights and Los Angeles, San Francisco and Seattle lights on the West Coast. But vast areas of darkness, pitch dark at night with no lights in between. In America, the politicians call those the flyover states because the only benefit of them is to fly over them to get to voters. <laughs> but I wondered, why do we collect ourselves together like that? Why don't we just spread out? Genetically, our DNA is predisposed to socialize, to find someone that cares for us and that we care about, to have a group of friends, to work together alongside others in some endeavor. This challenge of it is for me, when I look at it, I'm a bit saddened at times, that we're really bad at it. We're bad at getting along. Just turn on the news for a few minutes and you'll see how well we as social human beings, driven to connect, get along. Why is that? Research shows that four million people get married and two million get divorced. Another four million get married and another different two million get divorced. And we desperately love those people at one point in time. CPP Human Capital did an international study in 2008. And they asked the question of people, tell me about conflict. Do you have it in your life? 85% of the respondents said yes, they have conflict with other human beings at times in their life. 29%, nearly one third, say they have conflict with others in their life always or frequently. They ask why? Why is there conflict between you and others? 49%, nearly half, said it's because of personality clashes or ego. As I study that, I see for me, I see that personality clashes is the result of ego. I've had the pleasure, the benefit of being able to coach about 3,000 executives over the last 18 years. 400 of them CEOs. Why is that interesting? Because these individuals called leaders are paid to connect, paid to enroll, paid to create willing followers. So it's not an option for them to walk away. And when I meet with them for the first time, I always ask them the same question. I ask, is leadership a position of service or is it a position of privilege? And they think about it for a moment. And here's what their response looks like almost every time. Well, I would say it's a, it's a position of service. Yes, it's service. Politically correct answer. The thing that's interesting for me, I've always seen, is that pause. Well, I'd have to say it's service. Why the pause? Why is it not forefront in their mind, emanating from their heart, embracing the idea, oh, it's service. Oh, yes, it's service. Is it ego? Is that a natural human condition? We are driven by what we want. Not outwardly, not consciously. I don't wake up in the morning and neither do you to say, boy, I can't wait to see what I can get today. You want to also give. But behind the scenes, subconsciously, there's an internal conversation going on around how well did that meeting go? Was I embraced? Was I heard? Did I matter? I had to look at myself. I had to say, well, <laughs> everyone else seems to be a little bit selfish and their ego gets in the way. How about you, Dan? So I wrote down uh, a list of things that I stood for, my motivations. What, am I, what do I represent to the world? And I wrote things like, I want to make a difference in your life. I want to help you succeed. I want to help you matter. I want to help remove the conflict that exists inside your teams. And I said, well, that's a pretty good motive. Until I looked at it again closely and I noticed the first two words of every single statement was, I want. See, I want to matter to you. And I want to know I matter to you. So there's something in it for me. About 18 years ago, I had the privilege of going to a, a festival, outdoor festival in Lake Tahoe, California. 
and I'm walking around. There's about 2,000 people there. And as I'm walking about, I see the face of someone I recognize. It was the face of Dr. Leo Buscaglia. He had written 14 books, bestsellers, five New York Times bestselling books, and he was on every talk show in the, the, uh, the country at the time. He was a professor at the University of Southern California, and he had a class called Love 101 that was totally oversubscribed all the time. And I read his books, and so I know that he's all about love, selflessness, connection, and he's a big hugger. I walked up to him and I said, Dr. Buscaglia, my name is Dan Fox. And as I reached over, he recognized that I knew something about him, and so he gave me a big embrace. And, f and, we, and we parted, and for the next 10 minutes that we spoke, there was no one else that existed in the world for him but me. It was right here. Complete connection. Other people around, waiting. But I was the only one that mattered at the time. And I told him that oftentimes when I'm coaching a CEO who tells me that they're having an issue or a problem, I'll offer them some advice on what we should do. I would say, I found that this works, this doesn't work, and here's why it works, and here's why it doesn't work. And when I'm finished, I notice that they oftentimes tell me, well, Dan, I heard what you said. I, I, I get it. I, I completely understand you. But I would argue, and they come forward with a different opinion on something else. And it strikes me funny because it's like I would go and buy a guard dog and then run out in the yard and bark myself. Like, you're paying me for this coaching. And I know they have their belief system already wired by the time I hit the door. Their family upbringing, their educational background, their life experiences have them make sense of the world. They've got it wired. So I have an uphill battle the moment I walk in the door. But I explained that to Dr. Buscaglia as I was visiting with him, and he leaned over and he said, oh, Dan, and put his arm, put his hand on my shoulder, said, oh, Dan, you first have to show them the need. And I knew it must be a brilliant answer <laughs> but I felt like uh, grasshopper on Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. Like, I don't get it, but we chatted for a moment more, and we hugged again, and I walked away. One striking thing. I'm sharing with you an experience I had that lasted 10 minutes, 18 years ago, and it changed my life. For on the way home, for three and a half hours, I studied and thought about what he said. Dan, you first have to show them the need. You first have to show them the need. <sighs> I broke it down into one word at a time. Dan, you have to. Okay, it's not an option. It's critical. You have to. First, before anything else, you have to. Show. Show. It's not about talking. Not about advice. Not about coaching. I need to show it. How can I show it? Oh, it must be present in here first. I have to have it in order to show it. Show them the need. The need. What is the need? We want to be heard. We want to be respected. We want to be followed. We want to matter. Whether it's a leader or whether it's in a softball team or your home. I have to show them the need. How can I show them the need? Show them would mean I love you and I place you first. It's not about me. I remember the ego is the problem. Ego never creates connection with others. It does always cause conflict. Not only the ego of I want what I want, if it ever becomes aware in my consciousness that I'm being selfish, I can easily stop that. But peeling the onion back deeper, it's not only that, it's the subconscious desire inside. Oh, and even deeper, it's even the awareness of myself. See, Dr. Felice Leonardo Buscaglia, with me, was so present with me, he wasn't even aware of himself. Everything was focused on me for that moment. And I knew I mattered. So if you want to be a great leader, in the home, on the ball field, in your office or on the job site. We show them the need. We show love. And then they see the delta gap between the experience they're having with you in that moment and what they experience elsewhere. And they want it. It's a magnet. And in order to do that, I have to surrender my ego. How do I surrender my ego? I can't fake it. As it was said earlier today, 
we know, we all know that communication, 5% of communication is words, 35, 37% of it is tone and inflection. And I, I can, in fact, control the words that I choose to select to use with you. And I can change my tone and my inflection upon command. And I think, as a human being, that if I've changed, if I've selected my words properly and I've used tone and inflection correctly, I'll be able to have you get something that I want you to feel from me that I may not have inside myself. But over 50% is body language. 50% of communication is body language. Microfacial muscles. The rolling of the eyes. And oh, how easily we become dejected by someone, rejected by someone and walk away. If we first meet and I'm talking with you and I go, oh, I'm sorry, yes? That rejection, it's like, move on. There's billions of people on the planet. I don't have to make friends with Dan. I can move on. And so we move on. Because I'm thinking of me and I forget you're thinking of you. And so, well, we're not going to be close. I'll move on. I'll move on. And decade after decade, we move on. It's been stated that if we have one or two best friends in life, we're lucky. Why is that the case? Why can't we have 10? If we just collected a new best friend once every five years, what if we had 50 really good friends, 500 great acquaintances? Why can't we have that? I need to get rid of my ego. I need to be completely unaware of me in my communication with you to connect, to care and love. One of the interesting stories that I heard that actually came from my wife, it was brilliant, is that there were some ladies in the church that we attend that on Monday mornings would, two or three would go to a nursing home locally and they would paint women's fingernails as a service, being in service to them. I think it's great that they do that. I mean, I'm not embracing as a man, forgive me, I'm not embracing the idea of connecting with another male human being by having him hold my hand and talk to me, but that's just me. But she goes and, and does this work painting women's fingernails and, and after a couple of months she, she came home and she described to me later that she, when she's there she says, I, I, I keep thinking about what I have to do back at the house, back at the office. I really should be going. But no, I'll be in service. I'll be here and be in service. So I'll, I'll hold a hand and I'll paint the nails. And it came to holidays and she became more busy and she decided to say, I need to take a break. It's really too busy. But after the first of the year, there was something different that occurred in her heart. She actually felt grateful and blessed, and she wanted to give back that day. And they called and said, could you come back? And she said, yes. So she went to the rest home, and they said, she said, who should I paint the nails? And they said, why don't you go in that room over there and talk to Estelle and see if she'd like to have her nails painted. So Kathleen walked over and tapped Estelle on the shoulder and woke her up and said, Estelle, would you like to have your nails painted? And she goes, oh, well, yeah, I guess so. So they rolled over to the table and Kathleen said, what color would you like to use? And she said, well, my son went to the store and brought this nail polish to me last week, but I don't think I like it. And Kathleen stopped and goes, oh my goodness, and meant it. You must feel grateful and blessed. Your son went to the store, walked down the beauty aisle, looked at the hundreds of colors, chose one thinking of one you might like, and then brought it here to visit with you and give it to you. And she said, oh, I guess I am grateful. Let's use that color. So Kathleen, being a contribution selflessly in that moment, found herself asking, have you lived here long? Is your husband still alive? What did he do? Do you have any children? Tell me about your life. And she said it was interesting because she discovered that the conversation and the connection was so pure and so real and so cool and so giving, she had to remember to come back to painting nails. It used to be, I paint nails and let's talk. Now it's, let's talk and connect. And oh, we have to remember to paint the nails. And when she came home, she told me, I had the best morning. These stories are so incredible. One lady, her husband was a World War II fighter ace. If we just dig a little bit and we get outside of ourselves, we discover 
how fabulous connection can be. But there's the paradox. My natural back-running conversation is I want. But the only reason, the only time I get what I want is when I give me up and I give it all away. Two things for me, in order to surrender my ego, to be present with you in a meaningful way, I need to consciously focus on you to get unaware of me. And I don't know where you stand on this principle. It doesn't really matter, I guess. But what I've used for myself that also helps is, as was mentioned in the last talk, we have body, mind, and spirit. My body and my mind, I get it. The spiritual side of my life, that's something that's a little bit more difficult to lasso with your mind to master your emotions. So I can't do that. So once a friend told me, he says, you take a spiritual problem and you ask for a spiritual solution. Look to the God of your understanding whoever that is, and talk to him. And he said, you know, God loves to hear from strangers. Give him a call. Mm -hmm. And it does work. Imagine what it would be like if you went home and everyone in your home put you first. They sincerely lost sight of themselves and asked you, how was your day? Tell me about it. I care. You see, I love you. Right now I can say I love you. And you say, that's ridiculous. How can you say that? You don't know me. I know how you felt. I know you were disappointed once. That pit in the stomach when you did everything right and it still didn't turn out. I felt that too. I know you. You've been betrayed. Someone close to you stabbed you in the back and the stab and betrayed you and that hurt that out-of-body experience where you go how could they have done that we're close I know what that feels like too oh I have empathy for you you're just like me you've had a victory where you won everything turned out better than possible and you pumped your fist in the air and you walked around you can't stand it you're so exhilarated I felt that too see I know you because I know how you felt so I'm dying to get together with you and to find out the stories behind why you felt what you felt. But imagine what it would be like to have your whole town putting everybody else first. Your job site and your workplace. We can do this together. Just get rid of us. Thank you. <laughs>